somewhere in the crowd, sometimes you find someone very special. Someone who hears the unheard. Someone who understands the mystery. Sometimes there's someone who sees with the third eye. This video is brought to you by Patreon. Patreon, the happiest place on earth. For their first decade, Nickelodeon relied heavily on imported programs. While they could afford to produce the odd talk show, or relatively cheap puppet show, or merely co-produce a kid's sketch show, if you wanted adventure, suspense, and genre offerings, it was going to have to come in from elsewhere. In 1983, two imported Canadian shows, Adventures in Rainbow Country and Matt and Jenny, ended their runs on Nick, cutting the amount of narrative adventure television on the channel by half leaving just the Tomorrow People and the Adventures of Black Beauty. To help make up for this, Nickelodeon collected the rights to five serials with spooky, supernatural stories, four from Britain, one from New Zealand, and presented them under the banner of The Third Eye. The Third Eye. This show features programs about people who succeeded in life despite difficulties in life. Ah, yes, promotional ad. Difficulties in life, such as ghosts, witches, aliens, that sort of thing. I, th I think you might have been underselling the show here. The Third Eye was a pretty straightforward package show, similar in structure to previous shows like children's classics and first row features, with the only original content being the opening. But what an opening, am I right? Children frozen in a dark room, fog hiding the floor, red lasers separating them, while one of the children starts to glow with magical power. It's only beat by Are You Afraid of the Dark as Nickelodeon's creepiest opening. You also have some Mason imagery there with the Eye of Providence, which I think means this show was co-produced by the Illuminati. So let's dive into the third eye and see what it has to offer. Well, we're getting the worst one out of the way first. Based on the book by Vivian Alcock, this is the story of Cassie Palmer, a young girl who is the seventh child of a professional medium. Her mother sees wealthy clients and delivers messages to them from beyond the grave. Cassie has been told all her life that she'll inherit her mother's powers, but she's conflicted about that. She's not sure she wants those powers, and she's not even 100% sure they're real. Her mother could just be a very charismatic fraud. Well, that gets sorted out when Cassie decides to mess around in a graveyard at night and accidentally summons the spirit of a man named Deverell. Please go away and leave me alone, or I'll have to call a policeman. That will be very interesting. Call a policeman? Yeah. You, who cannot even call up a spirit correctly from the dead. <laughs> Deverell is a mysterious, brooding figure, but he says he wants to help Cassie. Says he's her friend. Cassie's family is suffering through some financial hardships at the moment, and Deverell points Cassie towards a secret treasure buried under the floorboards of an occupied house. Is Deverell really a helpful spirit? Or something malicious, trying to tempt Cassie into doing the wrong thing? I don't want anyone to be hurt. And I warn you, if you try and harm anybody, like you said, without asking me, I'll have you laid, exorcised. Do you hear? I can see that I must be careful. My only wish is to serve you, Miss Cassandra. So the overall plot is fine, if very, very simple. The big problem with the haunting of Cassie Palmer is structure. The story doesn't lend itself well to serialization. So little actually happens that there's no easy cliffhanger points to conclude each episode. So instead, the story just rolls on, and whenever it hits the 25 minute mark, they roll the credits, regardless of if it makes a satisfying end to an episode. Ask him back to the Asper tea. That's it. Ask him back to the Asper.
The result of this is that the story's inciting incident, Cassie accidentally summoning this spirit, doesn't happen until halfway through part two. Everything moves at a snail's pace, and there are a few subplots that could have been cut entirely, like one about Cassie trying to figure out how to end a school friendship when there's a good chance that she'll be moving out of town soon. There's some potential drama there, but it never actually reaches a conclusion. The serial just kind of forgets about it. There's maybe enough material here for a 90 minute TV movie. Definitely not a six part serial clocking it at around three hours. The serial was reduced by TVS for ITV and directed by 30 year television veteran Dorothea Brooking, while the screenplay was written by Alfred Shaughnessy, who is best known as the script editor for the television program Upstairs Downstairs. So they're not amateurs, but I think they really misguided the flavor this program took. While it's a story about ghosts, there's little attempts at creating a spooky atmosphere, and no budget for special effects, just a guy in a pilgrim outfit disappearing between cuts. Okay, in fairness, there is one decent car crash. Really, the serial is far more focused on the financial issues Cassie and her family are going through than the haunting. I guess discussions of class struggle and poverty is more in the wheelhouse of upstairs downstairs guy, but there's just too much of it and not enough of that tasty, tasty ghost action. The haunting of Cassie Palmer should have been half the length and twice the atmosphere, and sits as a weak start for the third eye. Thankfully, every other serial here is so much better. Based on the book by Maurice Guy, this is the story of twin siblings, Rachel and Theo. When they were toddlers, they became lost in a forest and certainly would have died from the elements if it wasn't for a mysterious man named Mr. Jones. After protecting the children through seemingly supernatural means, Mr. Jones tells them that he'll see them again when the time is right. Eight years later, the twins are off on a summer vacation in Auckland at their aunt and uncle's place. It's a very scenic city and the kids are having a fun time but things start to seem off. Over the lake from their relative's home sits a creepy rundown mansion. They keep catching the image of Mr. Jones out of the corner of their eye, but what is he doing here? And there's something in the water, something slimy and aggressive. It turns out that these slimy sea monsters and Mr. Jones represent two sides of an ancient intergalactic war. Two alien races who ended up in hibernation on Earth for thousands of years and are only now just awakening. The slug guys, the Wilbur forces, are shapeshifters, able to take human form, but struggle with human mannerisms in a way that makes it seem like they're just have the worst social anxiety. I have a parcel for the two children. Rachel and Theo from their parents. The children. Well, it's all right, has it? Uh. Well, they've just gone to Mount Eden. They won't be long. I'll come back. Mr. Jones wants the help of Rachel and Theo because twins, even if they're not identical, tend to share a psychic bond, which with training could be focused into other effects, like flashes of light that drive the slug aliens back. The twins are the only ones who can stop the Wilberforce's evil alien plans, so naturally they and their family are in constant danger of attack. So you've got young people unlocking their psychic powers and using them against alien invaders. Under the Mountain feels very much like a lost script for the Tomorrow People, just without Roger Price's cringy comedy and ugly misused special effects. Under the Mountain has limits in what it can do, and it knows that, 
not overextending itself with primitive chroma key or even super crazy alien makeup. The alien slug creatures are designed to look vague and are shot mostly at a distance or in the dark to help disguise their artificiality. That's actually pretty effective. Is that a monster chasing the boat? Or are the kids just overreacting? It's the classic Jaws technique. Letting people do most of the work in their own minds and, and that we, we couldn't show them that so we had to suggest it to them and, and let them think they'd seen it. And, and not seeing things often is more scary than actually fronting up to them. In fact, all the science fiction elements of the story feel a little subdued and underplayed, with more focus on some pretty decent child acting and soaking in the beauty of New Zealand. This serial loves panning over landscapes and using Auckland and its surrounding areas as part of the story, with characters traveling to pits of volcanic rock or canoeing into the forest. I wish I had higher quality footage to really appreciate how gorgeous of a production this is. Auckland is very much a character in this story. The fantasy of an invading alien race is common enough, but I wanted the action to be here, in places New Zealand children would know as their own. It had to be Auckland, where I grew up, and Auckland's main feature, for me, are its volcanic cones and its beaches. So place and players were decided. But how to start? One morning on my way to work, I passed Mount Eden, brooding, half seen in a mist, and I thought, I wonder what is living under there? The story grew from that question. Oh, and Under the Mountain also has one of the most painful looking stunt falls I've ever seen for television. Like, damn, that face hit rock. Ouch. Under the Mountain runs perhaps a little too long. It was originally scripted as seven episodes, but it got extended to eight during production. But it's a hell of a lot better pace than The Haunting of Cassie Palmer. Episodes end on cliffhangers. The plot is underway in the first episode. The threat escalates at a steady pace. You don't realize how much these things mean to enjoyable viewing until you don't have them. A significant amount of the cast and crew had come off a New Zealand soap opera called Radio Waves. This included director Chris Bailey, screenwriter Ken Catran, producer Tom Finlayson, and actors William Johnson and Glynis McDicole. It kind of makes Under the Mountain a reunion special of sorts. So here's a new area of research for me. The history of New Zealand television. The island country had a slow time of it, not having television until 1960, and even then only one state-run channel until 1975, and even that didn't hit the whole country. And even then, that one channel was exclusively black and white until 1973. The second channel was called TV2, because sometimes you have to go with the simple option. The channel's first head of drama was a British expat named John McRae, and he reportedly didn't have a lot of interest in hiring New Zealand writers for his shows, instead commissioning scripts from overseas. When McRae left in 1979, Radio Waves producer Tom Finlayson stepped up, and now it was the time for the Kiwis to shine. One of his first projects with New Zealand writers would be to adapt Maurice Gee's book. When Under the Mountain was mooted, it was generally believed that Maurice Guy would adapt his own novel. Maurice was a fine television writer as well, so was offered the dramatization first. I had been given a copy of the book to read, but had not. There seemed little chance of doing the show. Then one morning, Finlayson phoned me at the ungodly hour of 10am and summoned me to his office at once, because I was adapting the show. And had I read the book? Falling back to finally honed survival instincts, I lied and said yes. He then asked if I thought the Wilberforces would work well on screen. They could have been a new rock band for all I know, so I lied again and said yes. Luckily, it was a long bus ride into town, and I skim read as never before. Under the Mountain was a rating success for TV too, which encouraged the production of other children's serials in New Zealand, such as 1984's Children of the Dog Star, 1987's Steel Riders, and 1989's Night of the Red Hunter. For the Third Eye, being the only non-British serial makes it stand out. It makes you wonder how the Third Eye even came to be. Previous themed package shows had drawn from a single library per show. Children's classics drew from the BBC's classic literature serials. First Row Features drew from the Children's Film Foundation. The selections for The Third Eye are tonally similar, but come from multiple production companies in two different countries. 
It's possible that Nickelodeon had grabbed these cereals independently, maybe to be aired on the more grab-baggy special delivery, but realized they worked pretty well together. Under the Mountain is solid children's science fiction, and an interesting piece of New Zealand media history. That alone is worth the price of admission. This is the oldest of the Third Eye serials and arguably the most well known. This is the story of astrophysicist Adam Brake and his son Matthew, who have taken up temporary lodgings in the small village of Millbury, which is the site of a very large and elaborate stone circle. Thought to be thousands of years old, Adam's here to investigate the magnetic field surrounding the stones, which should super not be magnetized, but super are. Hang on a minute. Kevin. Stone acting as a magnet? Well, it's not possible. How much do you know about magnetic fields? Well, teach me, Professor. While the locals are nice and accommodating to these newcomers, things seem a little off. Most everybody seems a little too happy, a little too pleasant, in contrast to a few families that are also recent arrivals. Every couple of days, the town seems to empty out, and mysterious chanting can be heard in the distance. The children of the happy families are doing incredibly advanced maths at school. There's a poacher who lives in a cave that claims to be protected by an amulet with a serpent on it. And touching the stones proves to have a rather dramatic effect. Yes, sir, what we got here is a classic case of pagan worship gone amuck. If you see them start building a wicker man, I'd recommend turning tail and run. Oh, and they actually do. You know how when you watch a scary movie and you're all, hey, if they just left the haunted house, everything would turn out fine, and then you pat yourself on the back for your superior intellect? Well, as soon as they realize that they might be in danger, Adam and Matthew actually pack up their things and try to leave. But it's not that simple. This isn't just a town with a creepy cult, there are genuine supernatural forces at work. Force fields, black holes, ley lines, ancient churches packed with computers, and time loops prevent escape and do all sorts of weirdness. It's a surprisingly complex plot for a piece of children's media, one that rewards multiple viewings. With its subtle time loop mechanics, you might not know when you've been given a clue, since you're seeing the effect before you've seen the cause. There are at least four moments where I went, Oh, so that's what that meant. Clever. It's the kind of thing that if made today, there'd be dozens of clickbait videos in the 100 things you might not have noticed in Children of the Stones vein. I suppose you can make the argument that it's too complicated for children, that baby's first primer should really be a thing. I would disagree, though I will say Children of the Stones may have been better served with the creation of the home video market, allowing people to rewatch the serial at their own leisure and soak it all in. But even if you fail to see all the clues in this weird fantasy science fiction mystery, the serial is still effectively scary in no small part due to the soundtrack, which consists of druidic chants and rhythmic wailing. Come now. Not 
Between its complexity of plot and its frightening tone, I would argue that Children of the Stones is the most grown-up thing to air on Nickelodeon up to this point. Not in a little kid should watch it way, just that it's a higher reading level than most everything else on the channel. When Nickelodeon started with just five programs, things weren't really split into defined age ranges. Cy Schneider did some work to separate things by maturity of content, spreading apart little kid shows like Pinwheel and Dusty Streethouse from the big kid shows like T Tomorrow People and You Can't Do That on Television, a process that would continue to work itself out into age-defined programming blocks like Nick Jr. or SNCC. Children of the Stones really brought these ideas into focus, so much so that newspapers were writing about age ranges in Nickelodeon. One of the wonderful things about Nickelodeon is that its programming is age-specific. Among children, unlike adults, a difference of just a few years can mean a great deal in regard to their understanding and appreciation of programs. Nickelodeon addresses that problem by supplying programming for different age groups – preschoolers, elementary age children, teens, and all-around family entertainment. And Children of the Stones is a program that definitely falls to the older members of the family. While younger children might be enticed by its images, there is a good chance that they will be frightened by it as well. For the older ones, however, it's a mini-series that should hold their attention, stimulate thinking about science and the supernatural, and offer plain entertainment as a mysterious and provocative drama. Produced by HTV for ITV stations, Trill of the Stones was the brainchild of Jeremy Burnham and Trevor Ray, both screen actors turned screenwriters, and was filmed in the town of Avebury, Wiltshire, which had a real stone circle that the production was able to film at. I remember our research visit to Avebury before we started writing. We always knew it had to be Avebury, and seeing a large crow alighting on the back of a ram, after which both of them remained motionless, we knew then that this was the sort of place where strange things happen. As the whole story was based on the Avebury Ring, we followed both the geography and history of the village, which meant that the incomplete stone circle had to be completed with false ones. My wife and actress, Veronica Strong, told me that some Japanese tourists who were watching the filming stared open-mouthed as a member of the crew picked up one of the false ones and carried it away. One more thing about this serial I want to point out is that Adam and his son Matthew are a proper team in the story. It's pretty common in children's literature for the child to be on their own for the adventure. The adult figure either doesn't believe their child, or the child can't talk about it to the adult figure for whatever reason, or the adult figure is just plain absent. There are a few times that Matthew is explaining something he witnessed to his father, and he's not believed right away. But it's not because the father thinks Matthew is lying or imagining things. He totally believes that his son witnessed something, but Adam wants to make sure that there aren't other possible explanations. Eventually, both of them see enough weird things that they accept each other's experiences at face value and team up to try and solve this mystery. Of course, it's the other way up. Well, what are you on about? The black hole. The gravity's so great, not even light particles can escape. But whatever it is, this energy doesn't start there. It comes from here. So the dish here, the circle, it's a transmitter. What transmitting what? Evil. Or Hendrick's concept of evil. The capacity to do wrong. <laughs> the priest's sacrifice to his god. Now, hold on a minute. Where's the power source? Where does he get the power for the transmission? Do you remember the night I discovered that the ley lines all led up to this house? Ley lines? They bring the power. Psychic power to the circle. A pagan storehouse of energy. A young adult story where the child and the parent are on equal footing and both make contributions to solving the problem? It's surprisingly refreshing. I was already appreciating the complexity of the plot and the effective horror atmosphere, but even if I didn't have those, this character dynamic would have made Children of the Stones my favorite of the Third Eye serials. This serial was directed by Peter Graham Scott, who would go on to create our next serial.
Okay, so this is a TV show? Well, the rest of the programs in the third eye are standalone serials, or what you might call mini-series. Into the Labyrinth is a three-season television show that ran for 21 episodes between 1981 and 1982. Each season, or series, had a season arc, but each episode was largely standalone, without the cliffhanger that would define the serial format. It just functions way more like a television show. But the third eye only grabbed the first series. I'm not sure why that was. The more episodes you had, the more cycles of reruns you could justify. That's how Pinwheel stayed on the channel for as long as it did. But nope, just the first series, so that's what I'm limiting my scope to. This is the story of three kids, Phil, Helen, and Terry, who hide away from a storm in a cave. While exploring their surroundings, they come across a strange man trapped underneath a large rock. The children don't have the means to physically lift the rock, but the man has an idea. <laughs> Why not use magic? Here, I'll show you how. Think of it! Rising into the air! Think! Think! This is Rothko, an ageless sorcerer, trapped and weakened after his battle with the evil Baylor. They've been fighting over a magical MacGuffin called the Nidus, an object of immense, vaguely defined power. It's bound to Rothko, so as long as he lives, Baylor can't touch the Nidus, only keep it away. And to do that, she's moved it back in time. Rothko is now too weak to pursue the evil sorceress, and he's not too keen on asking children for help, but he has no choice. Rothko summons the Labyrinth, a maze that ties time to physical space. In other words, if you can figure your way through the Labyrinth, you can walk to the past. So the three kids enter the Labyrinth in pursuit of the Nidus, going to a number of different places and times. Ancient Druid societies, medieval England, France during the Revolution. There are a number of complications. One, Baylor could be around any corner, ready to stop them. Two, the Nidus disguises itself to fit in with its time period, turning into small trinkets. The only way to detect the Nidus is to see it in a reflection. They do have some help, as past versions of Rothko are living in these time periods, and if the children say his name to him, he'll know that he has to help them. It's you! You know this man? Of course I know him! He's the reason I'm here! It's Rothko! What did you say? Rothko? Rothko. Ha <laughs> ha! I am a Rothko! So tie up Rothko, would you? So we have our opening episode that explains the situation and a finale where Rothko and Baylor have their final battle. And then we have five episodes in between that have the exact same structure over and over again. The three kids arrive in a time period, try to figure out where and when they are, they find a local version of Rothko and get his help, Baylor shows up having taken the role of an authority figure in this time period, there's a subplot involving local characters that never gets fully resolved, Rothko and Baylor have a magic fight that ends in a stalemate, the three kids are just about to lay their hands on the Nidus before Baylor swoops in, speaks an incantation, and the Nidus is shuttled off to another time period. We deny the Nidus. Death to you, Loxley! I deny you the Nidus! Baylor! One moment. I deny you the Nidus. Suffice it to say, the writing gets stale pretty fast. The subplots involving the locals tends to be more varied and interesting. There's one where a schlubby middle-aged Robin Hood shows up suffering from a midlife crisis, trying to prove he's just as good as he used to be. But the Nidus always gets whisked away before these subplots get resolved, and the kids are forced to abandon the time period for the next. 
But what Into the Labyrinth lacks in its writing, it makes up for in how absurdly corny it looks. The three previous serials had pretty minimal special effects, instead focusing on naturalistic settings and low-key supernatural elements that could be produced on a television budget. Into the Labyrinth is the exact opposite. The majority of the show takes place in the same cave set redressed over and over again, and it's always a cave. The Labyrinth will take you to any time period you wish. Ancient Greece, the Islamic Golden Age, anything. So long as it takes place in a cave. There's a lot of cheap chroma key, a lot of cheap effect overlays, and some groovy psychedelic backgrounds for whenever Rothko and Baylor have their wizard fights. It looks so crappy that it rounds the bend and it looks amazing. Rothko! Rothko! once and for all. You send children, frightened children, to recover the night. <laughs> they present no problem to me. The kids are mostly a bore, but Rothko and Baylor make up for it with their over-the-top personas. They chew the scenery like there's no tomorrow. It's stunning in a way that only early 80s television could be. But also, this is early 80s British television, and there's an episode that takes place in Arabia, so hello, brownface! Produced by HTV for ITV stations, this show was created by Peter Graham Scott and Bob Baker. The latter you may recognize as one of the co-writers for Wallace and Gromit. He was also a frequent writer for Doctor Who during the 1970s, along with his writing partner Dave Martin. Together, they created the Doctor's trusty robot dog, K-9. There's actually a lot of Doctor Who DNA in Into the Labyrinth. Along with Baker and Martin, Robert Holmes, Anthony Reed, and John Lucarotti all wrote episodes for the show. Rothko was played by Ron Moody, best known for playing Fagin in the Academy Award-winning musical Oliver. He famously was offered the role of the third Doctor, but turned it down, something he would later say he regretted. A lot of Rothko's over-the-top persona feels like an alternate universe if Moody had played the Doctor, this is what it would have looked like thing. Can God invent a stone so heavy he can't lift it up? The revolution has abolished God, has it not? Ergo, there's no answer to no riddle. Go back to your soggy bread. <laughs> what did you see in the theatre? Tell me about it. I saw on stage the magnificent Mademoiselle saint Huberti in lavish extravaganzas costing ooh, 500 livres a night. Baylor was played by Pamela Salem, who had a substantial role in the Doctor Who serial, The Robots of Death, and also auditioned for the role of the companion, Leela. So Doctor Who and Into the Labyrinth are cousins, but I wouldn't say they share strengths. Yeah, Doctor Who has a lot of cheap special effects, but it tends to balance that out with variety and often politically charged writing. Into the Labyrinth feels cookie cutter in all the wrong places, but don't get me wrong, it's still fun. This is some grade-A cheesy nonsense. I was constantly entertained in a point-and-laugh, riff tracks -y kind of way. They probably weren't going for that, but at least it's fun. Based on the book by Dorothy Edwards, this is the story of four kids who are tasked with setting up a small local museum attached to a church. As they research their town history, they uncover accounts of witchcraft, and as if on cue, three old women show up, displaying weird and perhaps mystical behavior. I think the powers that be to stopped. 
At the same time, a woman finds a small statue of a little gargoyle creature, later identified as the Grinigog, and gifts it to her father, who uses it as a garden ornament. The man's young grandchild takes a shining to the little stone man and starts claiming it's speaking to him. Then there's Mr. Albister, who claims to be an anthropologist, but he clearly knows more about the magical things going on around town than he lets on. Uh, my sister seems to think that we might be in some sort of danger. Are we? That depends on what she or you call danger. works every time. But it didn't last time you came. Then that was before you put it up. Or was it magic? <laughs> and finally, a sad young woman in old dress trying to find her mother, who appears and disappears seemingly at random. So as the museum kids dig up diaries and artifacts, it soon becomes clear that the three women and that sad girl are witches from the Middle Ages who have escaped persecution by traveling into the future. The Grinigog is kind of like an anchor. It's used to be possessed by a church, but when the church was torn down, the Grinigog was free to bring the witches to our modern day. And now Mr. Albister is here to shepherd the witches to wherever they go next. This is a story about kids solving a mystery boxcar children style, but there's no threat, no antagonist. The witches aren't evil. They're refugees avoiding being burnt at the stake. The worst thing they do is steal some clothes from a department store when they first arrive, but they pay the store back later. They just want to sit around, drink tea, and help around the house. The most dramatic magical effect they have is a bunch of colorful, exotic flowers start growing around town. They're much more Mary Poppins than Wicked Witch of the West. But they're still figures of paganism in what is a predominantly Christian town, a fact that nearly got them killed hundreds of years ago. Is that going to be a problem now? And one other thing, you being the local churchman and all that. I was reared in an alien faith. Now, does that matter to you? Of course not. What faith, may I ask? Primitive. A primitive Methodist is not an alien faith. No, just primitive. I don't know it. Not many do. It's fallen by the wayside. Not many of us left now, only a few. The main theme of the witches and the Grinigog is that of acceptance of people of other faiths and cultures, but the way it's framed makes it less of a lesson and more of a hearty pat on the back for the white Christian majority. Sure, we used to burn witches and have crusades, but that's in the past. We're, we're much more accepting now. Bigotry is over. It's very much a white liberal text, a celebration of diversity while ignoring systemic issues and without having any real meaningful diversity in it. I mean, the witches aren't part of an actual faith. They're very much pop culture witches. Mr. Albister is a magical African witch doctor figure. And while it's not really a negative portrayal, and Nigerian actor Olu Jacobs is charismatic as hell, it's still a shallow, vague image of generic Africanism, and it's not representative of a specific culture or even a specific country. Like, sure, we all support peace and love, but if we showed a specific non-Christian faith, like, say, Muslims, well, it'd probably turn away our Christian audience, so here's some pop culture, general mysticism stuff. I'm making it sound mean-spirited, and it's not... It's a very pleasant story, but it's the television equivalent of slapping one of those coexist bumper stickers on your car. Nice sentiment, but ultimately empty. What makes The Witches in the Grinigog interesting in the context of The Third Eye is that it was a late addition to the lineup, licensed over a year after the other four serials were licensed, and the only one licensed after Jerry Laybourne took over as Nickelodeon's president and as such can be taken as an example of Nick's change of direction in 1984. The first four serials were spooky, and three of them were action-oriented, but this one is a conflict-free, peace-and-love affair. The Witches in the Grinigog almost reads as a statement of intent from the new boss. In fact, while The Third Eye was cancelled in 1985, 
The Witches and the Grinnygog re-aired as part of Special Delivery in 1986 and 1987. None of the other serials can say that, and while that might have come down to rights, it's clear that The Witches and the Grinnygog is a work that Nickelodeon believed in. The Third Eye was the last of its kind, the themed foreign import package show. Pretty much every one-off movie and serial after this point was dumped under the special delivery name. But Nickelodeon would acquire foreign television for a while still, and that would make up the bulk of Nick's output until the 1990s. So, in a way, Nickelodeon was the witches in the Grinnygog, bringing in some fun stuff from other cultures and throwing a party. You really can't argue with the sentiment. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Nick, 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 Nickelodeon. Next time, we reach Nickelodeon 1984, where a change of leadership would steer the channel into a new direction. But first, a few more PBS leftovers, thanks to our old friend Cy Schneider. Today's research shout-out goes to NZ On Screen, a wonderful website on the history of New Zealand television. They have profiles, interviews, even full episodes of some rare and interesting shows of Kiwi origin. It's definitely worth checking out. Thank you all for watching. We're entering Nickelodeon 1984, which means we're very close to Nick adding animation to the lineup. It's an exciting time for Knickknacks, and if you'd like to support it, perhaps consider contributing to my Patreon. Every dollar goes to keeping the lights on and improving the quality of each episode. You can also support the Pop Arena by subscribing to the channel, hitting that bell icon for notifications, leaving a like on this video, following me on Twitter, or making a one-time donation through Coffee. Some important links are in the description. Thanks for watching everybody, and I'll see you next time.